Good afternoon and welcome to Continuous Teaming, Core Protocols for Great Teams and Results with Richard Kasperowski. Just a brief note about eSynergy before the presentation. eSynergy specializes in open source and cloud resourcing. If you are looking for a new opportunity or to build out your team, please get in touch after the webinar. Now, moving on to some housekeeping, if you have any questions for Richard, please fire them over via the questions box throughout, and Rita will answer them at the end of his talk. We are recording the session, and the slides and recording will be made available and sent to you tomorrow by email along my contact details. Now, I'm going to pass over to Rita to begin the talk. All right. Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to our session. So the session is called Continuous Team and Core Protocols for Great Teams and Results. And uh, what we're going to do today is something very, very special. We're going to sort of start creating a new culture together, a new culture that orients our teams to be great, to get great results together, uh, to obtain what we want to be successful together. We're going to, in this short session, we're going to plant the seeds for that. We're going to start creating the conditions for great teams that get great results. And you'll be able to take these seeds that we've planted and use them with your real teams. So, hello again. I'm Richard Kasparowski. Welcome. Good afternoon to uh, everybody in the world. Good afternoon, good morning, good evening, depending on where you are. I'm Richard Kasparowski. I help people build great teams that get great results. I help people build high-performance teams, high-performance work teams, and help them build the, create, the, the conditions that help high-performance happen. I work mostly as an Agile trainer and coach. I teach a class at Harvard University called Agile Software Development. Um, I'm an author. I'm on the board of directors of one of the premier Agile communities in the United States, Agile New England. Um, and here's some of the tools I use, core protocols, agile, and open space technology. Um, I invite you to connect with me. So you've got my Twitter handle here, at rcasper, my email address, r at kasparowski.com, or richard at kasparowski.com, and my website, kasparowski.com. Um, I invite you to connect with me through these media or any other medium you can find. I'd be happy to take your questions, help you out in any way I can. And in this webinar session, I invite you to participate. Um, so ask questions as we go. I'm gonna, we're going to do a couple small activities. I'm going to ask you to participate in these activities using the GoToWebinar chat box. Uh, in fact, I'm hopeful that we can test it out right now. Uh, so if, if you're listening. Uh, will you open your GoToWebinar chat box? Just type something into it. Type hello. Maybe type uh, where you're from. I'll wait a moment so you can open the chat box and type something into it. All right, and we will move on. Uh, and if you're following along at home or at your office, all of the ideas that I'm going to share, most of the ideas that I'm going to share, are in a concise set of 11 protocols, 11 behavior patterns. They're called the core protocols. And you can get the details of the core protocols at this website, thecoreprotocols.org. Um, this may help as, as you're following along with the webinar, uh, so I encourage you to, to check out this website and uh, read the protocols as we go. And I'd like to start with this question. What's the best team you were ever on in your life? You know, it could be, it could be a work team. This is a work context that we're talking about primarily right now. 
could be a, a sports team that you want that you were on, an, an athletic team. Um, could be a charity group, a church group, some volunteer organization. Uh, it could be your family. Your family is a team. Um, any group of two or more people is a team. Could be your spouse or your significant other. Think about the best team you were ever on in your entire life. And maybe you can close your eyes and introspect so you can identify that team. Think about the feeling of what it was like to be on that team. And then as you're, as you're introspecting, retrospecting, thinking about that best team you were ever on in your life, what words come to mind? when you envision that team. And um, as you're thinking about that, if you'd like to participate, maybe, maybe type some of the words that come to mind in the chat window or in the questions box. Thanks, Adele. Yeah, so people often think of words like collaboration. They think of words like fun. They think of words like we accomplished our goals, phrases like we accomplished our goals, uh, phrases like we had shared vision, uh, we were aligned with each other, we were aligned with our customers, We knew what to do. Um, it felt good. We were happy. And so people have all different kinds of feelings when they think about their best teams ever. And it's usually good stuff. It's stuff that they want more of. It's stuff that, uh, that leads to success. You know, people, people include words like success here. You know, so what words come to your mind? And um, when you look at this list of things, you know, maybe even like greatness, when you look at this list of words, this list of feelings, the way it felt when you're on that best team of your life, well, when we think back to that, sometimes, well, we think that was awesome and we want more of that. And... Um, when I look back at my best teams, it seems like oftentimes uh, I can't figure out how that happened or why that happened. Like it was an accident. Uh, I got lucky a couple of times, and, and maybe that happened to you as well. And I wish I could get into that state with the team all the time. I wish I could reproduce that. I wish I could just have it be like that, have, have a great team for every team that I'm on all the time. And um, so that's what this is about, this session that we're doing right now. This will be a practical guide to the elements of great teams. We'll do a little bit of practice together. We'll practice a subset of these behavior patterns uh, through some fun activities. And whether we're doing it live with me right now or, or you're watching a recording of this, you can try these activities uh, with some of the people you work with or with your family or whomever you care about that you want to achieve greatness with. So this is a photo of a gentleman named Harold Shinsato. Harold lives in America, in the West. And uh, Harold and I were having a conversation about modern agile. So modern agile uh, is, a, is a concept that Joshua Karevsky has been introducing. And when he talks about modern agile, what he means is, well, he's trying to contrast it with the agile of our predecessors. The Agile of our predecessors has been around for 15 to 20 years. Right? The Agile of our predecessors is things like Scrum and Extreme Programming. Great ideas, and they've helped us a lot, and they continue to help us a lot. But we don't need to anchor ourselves to them. We don't need to blindly follow these ideas from old-fashioned Agile. Uh, Joshua encourages us to think for ourselves and find the things 
is that will help our teams be most effective. Harold, Harold Chisato in the photo, is, uh, is one of the leaders of the Open Space Institute in the United States and in the global community. Um, and he identifies three, the three most important things in modern Agile. The first one is mob programming. And so mob programming is an idea that Woody Zool has been, it's been spreading and popularizing and sharing with the world. Um, this is one of the key components of modern Agile, getting teams to work together, writing code and testing code at the same time, getting into a state of shared vision together. The second one is this work that I'm sharing with you right now, building great teams with the core protocols. So this is all about connecting together, getting aligned, being able to achieve awesome results together. And this is what I'm going to share throughout the rest of this session. And the third thing that he identifies is open space agility. So this is a combination of open space technology and agile software development. And it works incredibly well. Um, so this is Harold Shinsapta. Uh, I encourage you to uh, get in touch with him, read more about him. He is one of the smartest people in the world. And um, we're going to dive deeper into building great teams with the core protocols right now, one of the three important elements in modern Agile. And uh, we'll start with this question, why? Why do we care about this? Why do I care about this? Why do I want to share it? Why might you care about this? I've been studying and practicing this stuff for a number of years. And I became extremely motivated and uh, I, I discovered a better way to articulate it to people just recently, earlier this year. So back in February, in the New York Times Magazine, there was, a, there was an article about Google. And it was all about Google and Google's people analytics operation and um, things that Google is doing to research high performance in work teams at Google. So um, the story behind this, they called it Project Aristotle. Over the last 20 years, if you look at the business school lit literature, uh, publications like Harvard Business Review, there have been over and over different articles, uh, different, different articles published, different authors writing at something about the one most important thing you need to have a high performance work team. And uh, people have identified something like 250 one most important things. Like you don't need anything else. All you need is this one thing. People have identified something like over 200 of these one most important things. Google was curious about which of these one most important things really was the one most important thing. So they asked teams at Google to volunteer to participate in the study. They got over 200 teams to participate, and they measured the teams for these different attributes of high performance and uh, their actual performance, their objective and subjective performance. At Google, they found that there was one thing for Google Teams that contributed to high performance and it trumped everything else. And that one thing was psychological safety. Right? So psychological safety, we define like this. It's about interpersonal trust. It's about mutual respect. It's about being, feeling comfortable being yourself. You feel like it's safe to take risks without feeling it's when you're feeling psychologically safe, you're more likely to partner with other people. You're more likely to admit mistakes in performance. You're more likely to take on new roles. Right? You're less likely to leave the company, it turns out. You're more likely to harness the power of diverse ideas from your teammates. You're more likely to bring in more revenue. Um, these teams at Google were rated effective twice as often as other teams by the executives, and they had objectively higher performance. So they also shared this in, in their rework website, and you can check it out there as well. Um, when we're talking about psychological safety, we're talking about the culture of the team, or the microculture of the team. Um, these teams have group norms. Right? They have norms, and we know what the norms are. They're not necessarily written, right? So these can be unwritten rules. And, but we know them. We understand them. And uh, 
you know, if you've got the right group norms, it raises the team's collective intelligence. Conversational turn-taking is an example of a, an, an unwritten rule, of a, a cultural norm, a microcultural norm for teams that are very effective. Now, it, in the stuff that Google shared, they said psychological safety correlates to high-performance teams. And they told the story of a, a manager on a team. It was kind of like this team got lucky. They had a manager who helped everybody feel safe. And that team was a high-performing team. And so Google talks about this as a correlation. They don't necessarily claim that there's the causation. They imply it. Um, they also say that they don't necessarily know how to do it. Like that, that, that team in the anecdote, they got lucky if they, if they had a manager who could help them feel psychologically safe. Um, so Google knows what correlates to high performance, it's psychological safety, but they don't necessarily know how to teach it to people to make it happen on purpose. And as I, as I share this story with different people, I live, in, I live in Boston, Massachusetts, and the neighborhood where I live uh, is sort of like the dental capital of Boston. We've got so many dentists around here. Uh, I went to a new dentist, and I was telling her my story about, about the work I do and what I'm passionate about, and she immediately pulled out a dental magazine, a magazine for dentists, and there was this article in it about safety, about psychological safety, right? So it's not just technology teams, it's not just Google talking about this, it's everybody. Everybody understands this concept of psychological safety and recognizes it as an important component or the com important component of high performance teams. I made a new friend after reading all this. His name is Stephen Wolf. Um, Stephen is, uh, is a researcher. He's an academic and an author. He's done a lot of work with Vanessa Druskett. And here's an article they published in Harvard Business Review about 15 years ago. And they're talking about team emotional intelligence. Right, so I shared the Google work with Steve, and he kind of nodded his head, and, and he, was, he was thoughtful about it. And he was like, yeah, that's absolutely true. Psychological safety is something that causes high-performing teams. And he explained it to me. He, he, the story gets something like this. Psychological safety causes social capital to happen. And it's got a definition of social capital. Uh, it's, it's sort of like we can create good relationships with people in other teams and influence, a, influence them to help us accomplish our goals. And social capital also causes um, executive support. And then it's kind of obvious, like executive support, well, obviously, if you've got executive support, you're going to be a high-performance team. Your bosses are going to give you everything you need. Right? But then he then said that actually psychological safety is a side effect. It's not the thing that causes everything else. It's a side effect. It is caused by team emotional intelligence. And as we talked more, we're talking about the characteristics of team emotional intelligence, how they create psychological safety, and that it's also a correlative kind of thing. There's a correlation here between high team emotional intelligence and high performance. But we don't really know how to cause high team emotional intelligence. And so that's really interesting. Um, contemporaneous to all of this academic and business research about the, the characteristics of high performance teams, there's another body of work called the core protocols. Uh, so this body of work is, is observational. It's from people in the field, and it's led by Jim McCarthy and Michelle McCarthy. And their story goes like this. It's, it's a similar story. Um, they were the leaders. They were leaders of one of the best teams at Microsoft. So around 20 years ago, uh, Jim was the leader of the Visual C++ team, the compilers group. And one of the products they built, Visual C++, was a great product. They had something like 150, 200 people on their larger team. Somehow, this team built a great product. It was the best IDE ever, the best programming environment ever. It was so good that it put their competition out of business, um, like Borland. Borland was 
prior to Visual C++, the greatest compiler, the greatest IDE company that there was. Their products were amazing. And the Visual C++ team put them out of business. Portland went out of business after that. So Jim and Michelle were looking at what had happened, and they were, you know, they, they, they sort of had this, they had these same sorts of questions. How did we do that? Was that an accident? Could we do it again? Could we do that on purpose? Could we do it repeatedly? Um, they thought about continuing this research at Microsoft, answering these questions within Microsoft, like they could take another team, work with them for a couple of years and see if they got the same results, work with another team for a couple of years, see if they got the same results. They realized the sample size would be so small and it would take them too long to do that. So they left Microsoft and they started a team research lab, a high-performance teams research lab. In their lab, they give teams an assignment and five days to get it done. And at first, they would just watch. They would give people the assignment and watch them perform, watch them do the work to do, get the stuff done. And they started to notice patterns. The successful teams were doing similar things to each other. They started to factor out these patterns using the, the pattern language that, that was very popular 15 or 20 years ago. And uh, they, they noticed that they could also share these patterns with teams in the lab and in industry, in real work environments. Um, that they could even teach these behavior patterns to people and reliably reproduce teams that have, teams that get great results, teams that have very high performance. They didn't care about the academic research, they didn't care about looking at all these different characteristics, 200, 250 different characteristics of things that correlate to high performance. They just noticed that when teams follow these behavior patterns, they get high performance. So I shared this work with Steve Wolf, the team emotional intelligence guy, and he looked through the list and he's like, yeah, this is really good. These are specific behaviors that we can use that create team emotional intelligence. This is really good stuff. This is the stuff that we need to be able to make this happen on purpose, not just notice that it exists, but make it happen on purpose. So that's the story about this stuff, the core protocols, about things that correlate to high performance teams. And here's, here's another view of it. This is what I want. Maybe this is what you want. I want high performance teams. I want the teams that I'm on and the teams that I work with to be the best teams in the world. The work from Google confirms that psychological safety is the thing that correlates to high performance teams, causes high performance teams. Um, psychological safety causes high social capital, causes executive support and so on. And that stuff all get, goes into having a high performance team. Team emotional intelligence is the thing that causes psychological safety. Like it, it's, a, it's a broader view. It's, it's the thing that you want to instill in your team, that you want to somehow get in your team so that you can have psychological safety and get high performance. And in the research that people have done academically, they don't know how to make that happen on purpose. They just know that if you have it, you also have a high performance team. And so we've got the core protocols, separate body of research, but it turns out they're intrinsically related. If you practice the core protocols, if core protocols is the culture of your team, the culture of your organization, you get team emotional intelligence, you get psychological safety, you get a high performance team, you get a great work team. So when we start this, we talk about positive bias. And I'm just looking at the question box. So when I, when I share this with people, I share it as a, a stack. We've got six layers in the stack. The first la layer in the stack is called positive bias. Um, positive bias is about non-negativity, 
So when I say non-negativity, non what I mean is, well, first, while we're here together, and when you're with your work team, you keep things positive. Uh, you don't say, along with no negation, you don't say, that's a bad idea. You don't say, no, we can't do that. You don't say, that can't possibly be true. You always orient things into a positive way. Yes, we could do that. Yes, we could try that. Uh, yes, and we could add this on as well. And when I'm sharing this with people in a classroom setting, we ask them to pretend to suspend disbelief. As a learning strategy, this is the, this is the best way to learn things. Um, don't, don't reject ideas outright without trying them first. Pretend that these might be good ideas. Pretend that these aren't good ideas. And try them out yourself. Try them out during this session that we're doing. And uh, try them out with your team. Your teams, whatever, whatever group of people you want to try this with. Pretend that these are good ideas and try them out. The best learning strategy. Here's a way to try it out with your teams. Try this improv acting activity. And we usually give people uh, a little goal, a little assignment. The assignment might be something like, make a dinner plan for tonight. And so this is, a, this is a, a, an activity from improvisational theater, from improv acting. And the first rule of improv is agree. So improv is about making each other look good. Right? Uh, good improv acting, good, good improv teams, they say yes to each other. They respect what they've created together. They respect what the other actors have created. They know that for a great performance, your job is to help your teammates look great. It's not about you, it's about your teammates. Oh, and they're going to help you look great as well. So the activity that you could try is this. Try to make a plan for dinner tonight with, with a partner. And whenever your partner offers an idea, you respond, yes, but, and you finish the sentence. And your partner does the same thing. The conversation usually doesn't go very far. It, it goes something like this. Let's, let's try to get dinner tonight. Let's get dinner tonight. And your friend will say, yes, but I have a plan with my wife to do something else. And then you might try again. Yes, but maybe you could tell your wife uh, that you have a plan with me. And your partner might say, yes, but I'm going to stick to this thing with my wife. And you try to talk to each other for 60 seconds. It's incredibly difficult. It doesn't go very far. You end up not making a dinner plan. You end up feeling blocked, unhappy, disrespected. You end up feeling kind of bad. And then we change it. We just change one word. We change but to and and ask you to, uh, to do this again, try to make a dinner plan for tonight. And every time your partner says something, you reply starting with, yes, and. And the conversation is a little different, or a lot different. It, it goes like this. Hey, let's get dinner tonight. And your partner says, yes, and uh, let's leave work early for dinner. And, and you say, yes, and uh, let's, let's go right now. And your partner says, uh, Yes, and let's start at the pub. And then you say, yes, and after that, we'll go get sushi. And your partner says, yes, and there's this really great sushi restaurant in Tokyo. And you say, yes, and uh, there's a flight leaving for Tokyo at 6 o'clock. And your partner says, yes, and uh, let's book a ticket. Let's go to Tokyo for dinner. Right? And you end up just building amazing ideas together for a dinner plan. And you might even actually do it. Right, so this is just an example that you can try with people to experience the difference between sort of a negative bias and positive bias and really try out the feeling of positive bias with each other. I encourage you to try this out for real and uh, email me or tweet me. Let me know how it went. So um, this is one of the ideas that I've learned from Woody Zool, the guy who's been sharing mob programming with the world. This is an old idea from extreme programming, and the idea is to turn up the good. Whatever is good in your team, whatever's good in your life, really, do more of it. Turn it up. Turn it up to 11. 
this is kind of the foundation of continuous teaming. Anytime you see something good happening with your team, do more of it. You almost don't even have to ever talk about the things that aren't working well, the things that are bad, the things that are blocking you. They'll go away if you just amplify what's good. So look at what's happening that's good and turn up the good. So that's our layer of positive bias. And then on top of that, we add a layer of freedom, a layer of autonomy. And uh, when we're talking about freedom, well, we're doing it because, it seems like, all the great cultures in the world have an element of freedom in them. And we know from reading books like Drive by Dan Pink and Flow uh, by Mikhail Chisholm High, we know that this feeling of autonomy is one of the things that you need to feel good about yourself and to have great performance individually. And so we've got ways to build this into your team. The first one of them is called the core commitments. And these page numbers are from my book about the core protocols. Uh, and you can follow along from at thecoreprotocols.org. So we've got the core commitments. It's a list of agreements that we make with each other as teammates, that we could make with each other as teammates. It's optional. We have the freedom to choose which agreements we make with each other. And then we've got a protocol. So here's the first behavior pattern that you see on high performance teams. The behavior pattern is called PASS. It's very simple and very effective. It's a way to exercise your freedom and autonomy. It goes like this. Anytime you don't want to do something with your team for any reason, you just say, I pass. And then you don't have to do it. So you've got the freedom to choose what you want to do and what you don't want to do. And there are some agreements we make with each other as part of adopting the past protocol, the past behavior pattern. One of them is we don't try to convince you not to pass. Uh, we don't try to coerce you into doing it anyway. We don't try to, we don't, we don't talk about you for having passed. We don't talk to you later about having passed. If you want to pass, you pass. And if later on you decide you want to participate again, you, you just say, I unpass. It's kind of like saying I'm back in. Um, and you do the activity again. So a, a concrete example of this in software teams would be like if you're, if you're doing the daily stand-up with your team and for any reason you're just not ready, it doesn't matter why. When it's your turn, you just say, I pass. You don't have to say anything. You're not required to say anything on high-performance work teams. And when you're ready, you could, if, you're, if you're ready, you can say, I unpass. Now, if you're passing all the time, that might indicate something is your team or something is amiss with your state of mind. Um, so you might want to, you might ask for help on that. The next behavior pattern for high-performance teams is called check out. One of the core commitments is that I commit to engage when present. So the idea is when I'm physically present with my work team or I'm present um, through video session or something like we're doing right now, when I'm present, I am engaged. I'm with you. I'm doing the thing that we're doing together. A counterexample would be if you're in a meeting room with your colleagues and you're purportedly trying to solve a problem together, but most of you have your, your eyes down and you're looking at a keyboard, you're doing an email on your laptop, you're doing something else that's not the thing you're supposed to be doing together in that meeting. You're not engaged with each other. The core commitment would be I commit to engage when present. Your presence indicates that you're engaged. Check out is the behavior pattern that shows everybody that you're not engaged. If for any reason you can't engage with the group, you just say, I'm checking out. And you leave the room. You physically leave the meeting room. You leave the web chat. You become not present. So your, your lack of presence indicates that you're not engaged. Your presence indicates that you are engaged. And the same agreements that apply to pass apply to checkout. If you're 
checking out. Nobody can, nobody's allowed, this is a team agreement, nobody's, nobody asks you why you're checking out. Nobody tries to convince you not to check out. The remaining people don't talk about you for having checked out. Right, so we feel safe. We're also building the sense of psychological safety that Google talked about. We're, we're safe to pass, we're safe to check out. And this, this, these elements of freedom are the, are the next foundational layer in high performance teams. On top of freedom, we build this layer of self-awareness. Right? So we've got positive bias, we're, we're biased toward doing amazing things together, we have autonomy, we have freedom individually, and now we're going to build um, self-awareness. We're going to individually become awesome people. A great self is the atomic unit of a great team. A great team is composed of great individuals. Self-awareness is the layer of the stack where we start building that. The first protocol for that is called check-in, and we'll do an activity with check-in in a moment. Ask for help is another behavior pattern. On teams that have high performance, team members ask each other for help. And there's a, there's a pattern for how we ask for help, and you can, you can look up the details of that pattern. Very simply, it goes like this. You say, person name, comma, will you blank, you fill in the blank. So it would be like, uh, Christoph, will you, will you help me understand this, this topic? Or, or August, will you get me a glass of water? Personal alignment will also do a short activity on. So, fill in the blank here. Here's an easy three-word sentence. I feel blank. How do you feel right now? Actually answer the question. <clears throat> Maybe close your eyes and introspect again. How do you feel right now? What's your current state? What's your current emotional state? How do you feel? And write down your answer on a scrap of paper. Now do it again. I feel blank. But pick one of these four words. I feel mad, I feel sad, I feel glad, I feel afraid. Whichever one seems the most right for you, the most appropriate for you in your current emotional state. If you're not sure, if you can't decide, just pick one of them, pick a random one, and make believe you feel that way. Just pretend again. And consider describing to yourself why you feel that way. Like you might, you might say, I feel glad because blah, blah, blah. Whatever your reason is, right? I'm afraid. I feel afraid right now. And here's the reason. I'm mad or I'm sad. You can even do more than one. I feel mad and sad. I feel glad and afraid. I'm glad that you're all here with me at this webinar. I'm glad that this will be republished and more people can, can watch it and participate later on, for example. And if you'd like, you could share, you could share your response in the chat window or in the question box. Right, so if you'd like to participate, Type your sentence, I feel blank, and your answer, I feel mad, I feel sad, I feel glad, I feel afraid, and maybe why you feel that way. So here's an activity to try with your team. It's called check-in, this is the check-in protocol, or the check-in behavior pattern, and this is how it works. The speaker, it's you, you say, I feel mad, sad, glad, or afraid. You can add an explanation. You can also say pass. Oh yeah, we have freedom. And we've got this pass behavior pattern. So you can just say pass. Then you say, I'm in. It's kind of like end of transmission. It's, it's kind of like just letting people know that you're done. 
And then everybody in your team, they say welcome. Right, so you could try this with your team. You can see how this works. And then ask each other how that went, debrief. Usually when we debrief on this activity, people say things like, well, that was a little unusual. We don't usually do that at work, share emotional, share, share emotional state, share emotions. Um, or some of these seem like negative emotions, mad, sad, and afraid. Uh, so why would we use those instead of glad? And should we do something about it if somebody says, I feel mad or sad or afraid? And the answer to that question is, no, don't do anything about it. Just say welcome. Just acknowledge that the person has an emotional state and can articulate it, can identify it and articulate it. So this, this welcoming, this is one of the elements this relates to psychological safety, right? I can say to you, I can communicate with you about how I feel, and you don't tell me that's bad. And you don't try to solve it like it's a problem. You just help me feel safe. You say welcome. And this is obviously part of team emotional intelligence. If we can share our emotional state with each other and just acknowledge it, and just welcome each other, then we're approaching a state of high team emotional intelligence. So this is a, an observed behavior pattern that you can try with your team that correlates to high performance. There are a lot of teams that do this during their daily stand-up. Right? So usually in a daily stand-up, team members answer three questions. What did you get done yesterday? What do you plan to get done today? Is there anything slowing you down? There are a lot of teams that add check-in as a fourth question. So let's just start with, how do you feel? And then, what did you get done yesterday? What do you plan to get done today? And is there anything slowing you down? Try this with your team. Like, really give it a try. And let me know how it went. Tweet me or email me or, or, or text me or anything else. I'd love to know how this goes for you. All right, so um, we talk about continuous teaming. This is a, a concept borrowed from extreme programming, a concept borrowed from that particular way of, of agility. In olden days, we hardly ever integrated our code together. <clears throat> and every time we did code integration, it was kind of like a big bang thing, and it was a big problem. <clears throat> there were lots of things that didn't work together. There were compile problems. There was code that returned the wrong values to other, other code. Big integrations were big problems. They took a long time to resolve. It took a long time to resolve those problems. That's the right side in this picture. And the left side, this is continuous integration. We're integrating together small things. So we have small problems, maybe no problems at all. It's easy, and it's easy to resolve those problems if they even exist. With some of my team members, we do a thing called continuous check-in. And it's, it's modeled on continuous integration. So we either do it periodically, like every hour, every 15 minutes, we check in with each other. Or we do it when there's a state change. You know, like, so for continuous integration, that would be whenever I commit new code. Whenever there's a state change, I let you know right away. I don't wait until it becomes a problem. You could try this with your team, this idea of continuous check-in. Just check in all the time. Share your emotional state all the time. Try it out and see if it works. So that was the check-in protocol. And we'll, we'll move on to this. Finish this sentence. Complete this sentence. I want blank. What do you want? And this is another one of those things where you might close your eyes and really introspect. What is the single most important thing in the world that you want right now. I encourage you to write that down on a scrap of paper again. Like, really do it. And then, well, it's a want. It's not a have. It's not I have blank. It's I want blank. So it's something you don't have yet. Now think to yourself again, what's blocking you from having what you want? The most important thing in the world to you. Why don't you have it? What's preventing you from having it?
and then rewrite that first sentence. I want blank, but now pick one of these words. Self-awareness, integrity, courage, passion, peace, presence, self-care, fun, wisdom, health. Imagine that if you changed your want to one of these things, it would destroy that thing that's blocking you. Like if your body was filled with all of the integrity in the universe, or all of the courage or passion in the universe, you would get everything you want. Pick one of those words and rewrite that sentence. I want blank, pick one of these words. And if you're not sure which one to pick, try self-awareness. That's the default answer here. And then we'll call that your personal alignment. So this is another one of the behavior patterns for high-performance teams. The personal alignment protocol, it's a statement about what you want more than anything else in the world, the most important thing that you want. It's a personal thing. It's what you want. So this is about self-awareness again. It's about knowing what you want and maybe even sharing it with other people. So we, we've talked about the first three layers of the stack, positive bias, freedom, self-awareness, and con now we're getting on to connection. So we've built a team of amazing individuals who can do anything they want individually and do it really well, and they're very self-aware. They know who they are. They know how they're feeling, their current emotional state. Now connect those people together with shared vision so that they can work as one so that they can see as one, so that they can do amazing things together, so they can be an incredibly cohesive group of people supporting each other on personal goals and toward an awesome shared goal together. Now, three of the protocols for connection are also the protocols for self-awareness. Right? So check in, it's about knowing yourself. It's also about connecting with other people about your emotional state. Ask for help. It's about knowing what you want help with and connecting with other people to get the help. Intention, uh, personal alignment that we just looked at. It's about knowing what you want, well, and then we share it with each other. Intention check is a sort of a positive bias way of connecting with each other. Uh, the idea of intention check as a behavior pattern is don't assume ill will. If somebody does something or says something on your team, check their intentions. Ask them about it. Bill, comma, when you said blank, what were you hoping the consequences would be? How were you hoping I would react? What was your intention? That's an example of intention check. So you can try that with your teammates. Investigate is probably the greatest connection protocol of them all. And it's just about asking questions to each other. So here's a good way to do it. You just say, I'm curious. Will you tell me more about blank? It's about asking open questions. It's about being curious and open-minded. Uh, it's about getting more information, discovering more about your teammates. And here's an activity you can try based on the Investigate Protocol. And again, I encourage you to look up in the Investigate Protocol at thecoreprotocols.org. And the idea here is to learn about your partner's personal alignment. You be curious. You ask, don't ask leading questions. You don't push help onto people. Wait for them to ask for help. They'll ask for it if they want it. This is part of feeling safe, psychological safety. If I tell you something and you immediately push help on me, then and it's not the help I want, then I'm going to probably stop talking to you, stop connecting with you so much. And uh, try opening with a question like, hi, friend, what's your personal alignment? Or what do you want? Or what's the most important thing in the world to you? Right? Like important big questions. This is another thing um, from a, a New York Times article. Uh, there's a column in the Sunday Times, I think it's in the Times Magazine, uh, called Modern Love. And uh, my wife, Molly, reads it to me every Sunday morning. It's a really wonderful tradition that we have together. Um, earlier this year, the Modern Love column was about somebody who started dating again uh, later in life. And 
he decided he was never going to do small talk. He really wanted to learn about people fast. So he was never doing small talk. He was only going to do big talk. Investigate is, it can be about big talk. Find out as much as you can as quickly as possible. Ask the most important questions. And really try this with your teammates. Try it for five minutes. Just ask questions. Don't judge. Listen. Try it for 10 minutes or 15 minutes. Try it for an hour. Try it all the time. When we debrief on this, when we debrief on the experience of checking in, having a personal alignment, investigating, well, it actually seems like friendship. And it turns out that this is, this is what high-performance teams do. They form the bonds of friendship with each other. When I'm doing this with people, I feel this physical sensation in, body, in my body that I, that I either call friendship, you know, it's kind of in my gut or in my diaphragm area. I either call it friendship, sometimes I call it love. It's a physical sensation that I notice. And it turns out there's an easy recipe for it. If you're somebody who writes code, we've even written this as code. So you can just read this script, you can perform these things. It's check in with yourself, check in with other people, do a personal alignment, and investigate each other, don't judge. This is what friends do. Friends share their emotional state with each other without judging each other. Friends know what they want and they share it with each other. And they're curious about each other and what, and what we want together. This is what friends do. This is the recipe for friendship. It turns out this is also what high performance teams do. Right, so I'm not saying you actually have to be friends with the people you work with. But make believe you're friends. Pretend. Try it out. Act like you're friends and see what happens. You'll probably see that you're a high performance team. We call this continuous friendship. Just do this all the time. Here's an example of the ask for help protocol. Just fill in the blank. And when you fill in the blank, you're, the person you're asking is allowed to answer yes or no. And there's no coercion. There's total freedom. You can offer the help or not. This is my friend August. We were working together in London at a conference. And uh, we came up with this idea of continuous ask for help. Like, it turns out we always need help, and we're usually afraid to ask. So we just did it all the time. And we had a great experience teaching this class all day at a conference. So we add on to that productivity. Now you've got a great team, a group of people who are totally cohesive and can do anything together. Now let's do something with it. So we've got some protocols for that. I encourage you to look at these protocols in my book or at thecoreprotocols.org. Decider is a really efficient way to make total consensus, completely aligned decisions with each other. Resolution goes along with it as a companion behavior pattern. Resolution is a way to very efficiently resolve disputes that you have together. And these are specific behavior patterns that go into high team emotional intelligence. And perfection game is a great way to improve on each other's ideas. It's got a very positive bias. Um, it's something you can try. A lot of teams that I work with use perfection game when they're doing code reviews. They use perfection game when they're doing a retrospective at the end of a sprint. Like, we want to be the most amazing software team that ever existed. What can we do to be that team? It's a great way to get that feedback. So look at the protocol. Look at how it works. Ask me for help if you want the help. And let me know how it goes. We do some activities with people uh, to help teach Decider Protocol. Here's an example of an activity we do. And we use Decider Protocol in the activity. And we also, we've been playing with this idea called continuous decision making. Big decisions are really difficult. People say no. They're really hard to implement. People aren't aligned on them. But if you make small decisions all the time using a tool like Decider Protocol, you'll see that it's really easy to make forward progress with your team. And then at the top layer of the stack, we've got error handling. This is just a way to get back on track. 
make sure that we're maintaining all of the layers of the stack below. And the, the final protocol, the 11th one, is called protocol check. And uh, it's really just a reminder to each other. It makes it a very safe way for us to remind each other about our microculture, our team agreements and norms, and to make sure that we're operating under our team agreements together. Uh, we've, we've, we've tried a thing called test-driven teaming. It seems to work. It's like test-driven you use your teammates as the test harness instead of a tool like JUnit. You ask for help. You ask your teammates to check in with you at a later date and see if you did the thing you were hoping to do. Like, I had trouble asking for help. So I want my teammates to ask me whether I've been asking for help. And then because I know they're going to check with me to see if I've been asking for help, I do it. And the test goes green. Put these ideas all together, we call this continuous teaming, maybe even extreme teaming. This is my friend Hallie and I. We were building a giant origami crane. It was like, uh, it, was, it was about two and a half meters. The wingspan was about two and a half meters. So the ideas of continuous teaming are, are these. Turn up the good. Like do team building all the time. Do it all the time. It's not a special event. It's something we always do. Try continuous check-in. Check in with each other all the time. Ask for help all the time. Investigate all the time. Try these friendship patterns all the time. Do decision-making, small decisions all the time. Try test-driven teaming. Do these things all the time, and they become really easy, and you get high performance as an output. Try core protocols all the time as the specific behavior patterns to get a high-performance team. And then, you know, I'd ask you, what's your next step? Which of these tools would you try with your team later today or tomorrow? And actually answer that question. Write it down. Or look at the coreprotocols.org and pick one of them and try them out. Maybe check in as it's something you could try with your team tomorrow. Finally, as we start to wrap up, um, I want your help, so I'm going to use one of the behavior patterns called Ask for Help. Will you play Perfection Game? Another of these ideas. Will you play Perfection Game on this webinar? You could scan that QR code. You could go to great people slash perfection123. I want your feedback. I want this to be the best presentation ever. So. Please connect with me. Please uh, fill in the evaluation form for this session. I want your help, and I'd appreciate your help. Uh, if you want an easy way to do these things, to measure your team's emotional health and psychological safety, to compare to global norms, to see what's working for your team, check out the Great Teams Survey at greatteamssurvey.com. Uh, if you want an easy way to learn and embody these behaviors, really practice them uh, beyond what we can do in a webinar, Check out Great Teams Academy, greatteamsacademy.com. And, and on the feedback form, you could let me know that you're interested. We've got some classes coming up, a uh, session at Santa Barbara Agile on September 12th of 2016. We're doing a five-day class in Italy later this autumn. And uh, we're doing a half-day class in San Francisco in November. So if this stuff interests you, check it out. Uh, we'd love to share more with you. And these are some easy ways to, to, to get more. Uh, key takeaways, right? The attributes and behaviors of high-performance teams are known and learnable. They don't have to be by accident. You can practice this stuff on purpose and get a high-performance team on purpose. The core protocols are specific behavior patterns that cause high team emotional intelligence, which causes high psychological safety, which causes high-performance team. And try continuous teaming. Turn up the good. Team building is good, so do it all the time. And use core protocols as a way to do that, to do great team building all the time. Uh, to learn more, I encourage you to read the book from Jim and Michelle McCarthy called Software for Your Head. They lay out all these ideas in great detail. Uh, check out my book, The Core Protocols. It's very concise. Look at thecoreprotocols.org. And um, check out my website for upcoming events. Thank you all for, for joining me. Thanks for uh, participating and watching the webinar. Um, 
invite you again to get in touch with me through Twitter, through email, check out my website. Any way that you can get in touch with me, I am eager and happy to assist you. Uh, that's it. Let's see if anybody has any questions. We might have a few minutes left that we can do some questions. And um, from there, we'll turn it back over to our friends at eSynergy. I don't see any fresh questions. So I'm all set. Friends at East Energy, do you want to take over? Yeah, so thank you for joining the webinar and you will receive the recording tomorrow. Thank you, Richard. My pleasure.